I'll never forget the first time I drove my car into New York City. Now, of course, I'd driven my car in a lot of different places, small towns, suburbs, cities, down country roads, on freeways, all the way across the country. So I was very familiar with my car and how it handled. But on the cutthroat, chaotic streets of Manhattan, it was a completely different driving experience. It felt more like I was an unwilling participant in a real-life video game or that I was living out some kind of weird apocalyptic car chase scene in an action movie. I had a death grip on that steering wheel, and I was exhausted from all the stress and anxiety. It was such a relief to find a parking garage. <laughs> I might have known my car very well and had spent a lot of time behind the wheel, but being in New York City traffic, that was a whole new experience. It made me wonder if my feeling of danger by driving in New York was real? Or was it just my perception? So later I looked at some statistics online and I discovered a funny thing. New York City ranks pretty far down the list of dangerous places to drive as far as accidents per capita. You want to guess the most dangerous state to drive in? Mississippi. The most dangerous city? Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Statistically speaking, it's far safer to drive in New York City than to cruise the streets of Kansas City or Tucson. So it was a reminder that context matters and my preconceived notions matter and not just about driving. I know I can so easily become familiar with my routine surroundings and I can be so comfortable with what I know that I can assume my context where I live, the people I hang out with, my life experiences, that represents what's normal, even what's right. It's sort of like being so familiar with my car. It just is. It's my truth. And not only is my experience normal, I can assume that my normal is shared in common by others. It's only when I drive in a different setting, where the traffic is a lot more dense and moving a lot faster, do I feel frazzled and I realize, hmm, my normal is not the same as everyone else's. I might perceive their normal as dangerous or even wrong, but the truth is their normal is merely different. And per capita, their normal may actually be a lot safer than mine. Now that bias we all have toward what's familiar to us, that what's familiar is also what's normal and best and right and proper, well, that carries over into a lot of things. It can carry over into how we perceive anyone who looks different from us, who comes from a different country, who just speaks a different language, who dresses in an unconventional way, whose sexual orientation or gender identity may be different than ours, whose economic status is different, whose politics are different, whose religious beliefs are different. It's understandable up to a point for us to encounter someone who doesn't fit our idea of normal and at first hold them at arm's length until we have a chance to wrap our minds around who they are and what they are about. But it takes some effort to truly wrap our minds around anything, to understand deeply who someone is and where they are coming from. So it's often a lot simpler to ignore them or just turn away, to say, Thanks, but that's not for me. It involves risk, and you might even say some faith to be open to listening, understanding, and accepting anything or anyone who goes beyond our bias of familiarity. The thing is, when, when we cannot do that, when we're comfortable in our bubble of normal and right, we can also tend to regard those <clears throat> outside our normal range as somehow less than or unworthy, even as someone to be feared or as an enemy. And I am pretty sure that is why Jesus talked so much about Samaritans and dealt with Samaritans so often. There was a time he had a long and meaningful conversation at a well with a Samaritan woman. And of course, we all know the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then there's the story of the 10 lepers Jesus encounters one day whom he told to go and show themselves to the religious authorities as being healed of their ailment. But only one leper stopped in his tracks, turned around, and returned to thank Jesus. Luke tells us, and we so often miss out on this detail, that that single leper was a, you guessed it, a Samaritan. It's too bad we can gloss that over because it just might be the whole point of the story. 
The Samaritan angle may also be a bit more obvious in the episode about the woman at the well. She had plenty of other issues that Jesus took seriously. But his disciples who came up and discovered him talking with her, they were appalled at what he was doing, not because he was having a chat with a woman at a well, but because she was a Samaritan. You just don't mix with those people. <laughs> and it's even more obvious in the Good Samaritan parable. And we all know that one pretty well. The reason it was so amazing and memorable was not because a nice man stopped to help another man who had been beaten up and left for dead by the side of the road. It was shocking <clears throat> because the injured man was Jewish and he had been ignored and avoided by two highly regarded Jewish religious leaders long before the Samaritan ever came along and helped him, saved the man. It was inconceivable to the hearers of that story who were Jewish for a Samaritan to be the hero precisely because he was a Samaritan. <laughs> there's, you know, there's really no good equivalent today to what it would be like to be a Samaritan living in Jewish territory. <clears throat> I think it'd be something like showing up at a Philadelphia Eagles football game all decked out in a Dallas Cowboys jersey and hat. Can you imagine? Now, not that I'm saying if you're a Phillies fan, uh, and I, I'm not an uh, Eagles fan, that you have to love the Cowboys or their fans. I, I, I know that there are some lines that cannot be crossed. So what's the big deal about Samaritans anyway, and why did Jewish people hate them so much? Well, historically, the Samaritans were Jews who did not get deported to Assyria when the Assyrian Empire invaded Israel about 700 years before the time of Jesus. Now, a lot of Jews, no one knows how many, but probably tens of thousands, including the key religious leaders and royalty, they all got hauled off to Assyria in chains. There were Jews who stayed behind, though. The Jews who became known as Samaritans were the ones who stayed behind and got along okay with the Assyrians. So in the eyes and the hearts of the Jews who eventually returned from captivity, the Samaritans were traitors and heretics of the worst kind. The form of Judaism the Samaritans came to practice was deemed to be illegitimate. Not the one true faith. Mm -mm. So Samaritans were seen as obnoxious idiots of the worst kind. Sort of like the Cowboys, if you're an Eagles fan. And again, in this story of the ten lepers, it's pointed out that the only leper who returned to thank Jesus was a Samaritan. And that fact alone makes this story remarkable because someone from outside the established faith Someone who did not belong, an outcast, a traitor, a heretic, a rube, is the one guy who has the presence of mind to say thank you. And he's the one who is told by Jesus, your faith has made you well. Now the truth is all ten lepers were made well by their faith. It's interesting that for all ten, the words of Jesus really had no effect on them until they believed what he told them was true and they had turned to make their way to see their respective priests. Back in those days, a priest had to look you over and certify that you had been healed before it was official. Priests were sort of like public health officials. Luke tells us specifically, though, that it was as these ten lepers went on their journey that their leprosy vanished. And, and leprosy is a whole other sermon. It, it was horrible. Not only a disfiguring physical condition, Maybe worse, though, you were a complete social outcast. You were religiously impure. And in the context of Jewish culture, being a Samaritan who had leprosy, too, that was an especially tough burden to bear. Now, is that why he was the only one with the manners to turn around and thank Jesus? Because he had more reason to be grateful than the others did? We don't know. He was still a Samaritan, whether he had leprosy or not. The key thing, I think, about the Samaritan leper is that Jesus acknowledged something that went far beyond the imagining of his disciples or anyone else who had witnessed this event, and that was this. Even a Samaritan was considered worthy and welcome and valuable and was saved. Because that's exactly what it means to be made well, which is what Jesus told the guy. You're made well. And that phrase, made well, had enormous weight to it. In the original Greek of the New Testament, it is the word sozo, S-O-D-Z-O. -O. Now, throughout the Gospels and other books of the Bible, sozo is translated into English to mean saved or being saved or healed or made well. 
And in our modern use of the word saved, and in a religious context, it's often come to take on a somewhat different kind of meaning. Uh, we'll say that someone is saved when they confess that they believe in Jesus, and that means that uh, when they die, they'll get to go to heaven. Now, I won't argue that we get to go to heaven, but when it comes down to it, going to heaven or not after we die, that was not the original concept of sozo, or being saved. Now, part of that has to do with the concept of heaven as being a place that only exists somewhere up there for our spiritual selves to inhabit after we die, as if heaven is only an afterlife location. The thing is, that's more of a Greek mythology idea of heaven. It's not exactly how Jesus ever defined heaven. Heaven, more accurately, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus referred to, is a reality that exists right here and right now. As much as it extends into the afterlife, heaven is on a continuum that spans this life and the next. Jesus is pretty clear that the kingdom of heaven exists in you and in me. And we catch glimpses of it whenever justice and peace are made real by our actions. Heaven comes down, in effect, whenever we speak a word of kindness, whenever we help someone in need, whenever we feed the hungry, whenever we welcome the stranger, whenever we forgive without any expectation of reciprocity, whenever we give ourselves away in unselfish love. The kingdom of heaven is made real when we act with courage in the face of adversity, when we make peace, when we see the big picture that the person you once believed was so different from you carries within them the same value and dignity and hopes and dreams that fill your own heart and soul, and you recognize that you are connected to them by the unbreakable bonds of God's love. Being saved, being healed, is awakening to that spiritual reality that already is. By your faith, by your willingness to risk, by your reaching out in love, you are healed, you are saved. By going beyond our limitations, our blindness to injustice, the sickness of our bigotry, the ailment of our prejudice, the hard boundaries of our bias, all those things that tell us that someone's not normal or they're wrong or bad or unworthy, those things are merely our perceptions. They're not the truth. The truth is, in one way or another, we're all Samaritans. We're all Jews. We're all Christians. We're all none of the above. We're, we're all heretics and the faithful. We're all sinners and saints. We are all those who run away and those who return to say thanks. We're all children of the same God, and we've been given the gift of awakening to the heaven that is within us and all around us and in one another. If we look and see and act, we know we're all saved. We're all made well.